Hello. Today, I'm going to be telling the stories of four ships which disappeared on the Great Lakes. This book is basically just a collection of stories about ships that disappeared on the Great Lakes, sometimes without a trace, while in other cases there are wrecks or debris which give us a clue as to what happened. So, I thought it would be fun to go through and tell a story from each of the Great Lakes. First off, from Lake Superior, let's tell the story of the Manistee. From Lake Michigan, let's do the Ralph Simons. Why not? Our star attraction from Lake Huron will be the Regina, and our eerie tale from Lake Erie will be the South American. Settle in, and let's tell some tales from the sea. Not the sea. The mini sea. The Great Lakes. It's basically a mini ocean. Let's go! All these stories we cover today are going to be read straight from that book. I'm going to read the story off camera, take notes, and then retell it to you. And if you like this video, I could easily do it again because these four are just the tip of the iceberg. This book is just full of these kinds of stories. So like and subscribe if you want to see more of this. And with all that said, let's start with the Manistee. In the mid-19th century, commerce on Lake Superior boomed with the opening of the new canal. New ships were built as trade across became easier and more profitable than ever. The steam-powered schooner Manistee can be called a bit of a hybrid ship. She was built to carry both cargo and passengers. While she wasn't the most luxurious ship, she held to the standard of her class and was the perfect example of early steam power from the days of ships moving away from the need for sail power. The Manistee was built in 1867, a little over a decade after the trade boom on Lake Superior happened. She was built by E.M. Peck in Cleveland under a contract from Engelman Line of Milwaukee. After having a first and unsuccessful career on Lake Michigan, she was modified and moved to Lake Superior after being purchased by Duluth Interest in 1872. After that, she was purchased by the Ward Line and began running trade goods from Buffalo to Duluth. And she finally found her home when she was purchased by the Lake Superior and South Shore Trade, and she had a new route assigned to her, though she still visited Duluth on this new route. Jumping forward in time a little bit, we arrive in 1883. The Manistee was in the port at Bayfield, Wisconsin, having been held up there for days due to poor weather. Every time she tried to leave to continue on her route and deliver her cargo to its next destination, the weather forced the crew to return to port. Finally, on Thursday, November 15, 1883, there was a break in the gale close to 9 p.m., and the Manistee made to leave. Her destination was another port 75 miles away to the east. More ships followed her out of port, having also been delayed by the weather. When one of these ships, the city of Duluth, arrived at her destination, her crew reported the Manistee's departure. Her delay was not a concern. As I said in the video about the Waratah, back then ships could be weeks overdue and it wasn't really a concern due to constant mechanical malfunctions, as well as communication limitations. Some even assumed that she turned back or headed to another port for freight. But when ships arriving at these ports still reported nothing, people began to worry. Ships of all types began searching for any signs of the Manistee, even for wreckage. Messages were even wired across the lake, telling ships from all over to keep an eye out for anything, even for wreckage. For the time, it was as thorough of a search as could be made. The tug Swine reported passing through a large wreckage field. The field apparently took four hours to pass through and consisted of objects like tables, chairs, beds, barrels, buckets, evening dress, cakes of butter, and other miscellaneous foodstuffs. For the next six months afterwards, wreckage continued to wash ashore on various beaches, some reaching the northmost point of the whole lake. Manistee's rudder and large amounts of barreled flour were found between Eagle Harbor and Copper Harbor. The Copper Harbor Lighthouse even recovered 44 barrels. Beaches all over the coast of Lake Superior were littered with hundreds of pieces from the Manistee, 
including part of the signboard bearing her name. In August, part of her cabin and several marked life preservers washed ashore, and other items as well, on a northern beach. Nearby, the skeleton of a man still wearing a badly decayed furred coat was found. The loss of the manatee was called a, quote, profound sensation, unquote, all around Lake Superior at the time. Many in the region wondered what happened to the ship, when others following only 10 miles behind her escaped unscathed. They all passed through the same gale, so why did the manatee fall victim? Well, looking at the evidence we have today, and other clues we can find in history, we can maybe put some of the puzzle pieces into place. The gale was no doubt a fierce one. A newspaper from the time said it was of unexpected violence. We know this is true because the Manatee's captain sheltered in the Abbeyfield port for as long as he did, and only took the ship out onto the lake when it appeared that the gale had finally broken. This is supported by the fact other captains also left port shortly afterward. So one theory is that after leaving port, the Manistee was struck by a squall, and once she was away from land, there was nothing holding back and nothing protecting her from the full force the angry lake could throw at her. A journal entry from the Eagle Harbor Light Station at the same time made a mention of the fact that the wind was also constantly shifting from point to point. Theories back then also considered the fact that she was recently rebuilt as being related to her vanishing. But this is not conclusive evidence, and in fact, it is seen today as negligible. Another thing that should not be seen as overly important is the fact that the tugs which searched for her could not immediately find a wreck. Searching Lake Superior back then was not even a remotely easy task, so the lack of clues is expected. There is basically evidence of a location where the manistee might have foundered. Today, most agree she likely sank somewhere in deep water between Bayfield and Ontonagon. In 1885, a message in a bottle was discovered in a bay. If it is authentic, it remains unknown. But this is what the note said. This is of the manistee, in a fearful storm, may not live to see morning. Ever yours to the world, John McKay, Captain. The captain's brother considered the note to be the work of a, quote, wag, who was trying to stir up a sensation. The Manistee's career was marked with many ups and downs. She never enjoyed a blissful and unblemished career, and bounded between owners for a time. In all likelihood, her wreck will never be found, if she is even still intact, and she will remain on the bottom of Lake Superior, never to see light again but rather rest silently in the dark on the lake floor. Today, she is not widely remembered, and even back then she was replaced quickly. The steamer City of Fremont took her place, but even back then, people said that she couldn't quite replace the missing manistee. So at the very least, she was fondly remembered for a time by those who got to see her in her full glory. Affectionately named the Christmas Tree Ship, the Ralph Simons was a three-masted schooner that people of Chicago would excitedly look forward to seeing every year. She brought many happy memories to a lot of people, but her story would end in tragedy as she would sink with all hands on board in northern Lake Michigan in 1912. First though, let's give the ship a moment to enjoy her glory days again before we get to the tragedy. The Christmas trees she brought every year were mostly pine and balsam. Many people depended on the Ralph Simons and other ships owned by the same company she belonged to for their Christmas trees every year. At other times of the year, the Ralph Simons would still haul lumber, which was used in hotels and churches. The ship was a lumber schooner. It didn't just sail at the Christmas season to deliver Christmas trees, after all. It was no secret that running Christmas trees across Lake Michigan in November and December was very dangerous. Back then, and even still today, it is very risky to sail on the lakes at that time of year. Today, we can predict the weather with our modern technology, but back then, gales could come crashing out of the north onto the lake with no warning, and giant waves could come out of nowhere and crash into small wooden ships and crush them. Freezing temperatures could coat sails and rigging with ice, 
old schooners were at an increased risk during this time of year, but their owners would often take the risk due to the money to be made. Though the Ralph Simons was operating relatively recently, again sinking in 1912, she was an old ship, a beautiful ship, but an older ship, having been built in 1868. On what would become her final voyage, the Ralph Simons departed Thompson, Michigan at noon on Friday, November 22, 1912. She normally carried a cargo of 27,000 trees, but on this trip she was heavily overloaded, having as many as 50,000 trees. So many that they had to be piled out on deck because her hold was simply filled utterly. To say she had a full belly would be an understatement. On her last voyage, the Rouse Simons had between 15 and 17 people on board her. For the size of the ship and the amount of people needed to crew, this was an unusually large amount of passengers going for the ride. As the Rouse Simons left port and began her run to the south, a storm was threatening to break. We've established that at this time of year, it was dangerous for old ships to sail out on the lake. Well, shortly after leaving port, the storm which was threatening indeed did strike. And I'm going to read this text directly from the book because it is chilling and paints a vivid picture. Quote, It struck, bringing sheets of blinding rain, screaming winds, and rolling seas to ravage the old schooner. Unquote. Shortly after the storm struck, the tugboat Berger, which was towing the Dutch boy, caught sight of the Ralph Simons. But unlike the tug, the schooner was heading out into the open lake. The next morning, 80 miles to the south, the lifesavers at Sturgeon Bay caught a glimpse of the Ralph Simons flying distress signals. But the snow was falling so heavily, and the waves were of such a giant size that they couldn't do anything. All they could do was watch the schooner struggle along out on the lake, on her own. They did, however, contact other lifesavers at a station 23 miles to the south to tell them the ship was coming their way and that they might be able to help once she the captain, the leader of the second station, later sighted the ship. She was far out on the lake and still flying her distress signals. Her crew were no doubt pleading. But again, they couldn't help her or her crew. All the station had were simple rowboats and it was impossible and a death sentence to brave the waves out to the ship. So the captain telephoned a third station, the Two River Station, and alerted the captain there of the Simon's distress. This station had a 34-foot-long powered lifeboat that, with a little luck, could head out to the ship and return safely. The Two Rivers crew rushed to prepare. To protect themselves from the cold, they bundled into their warmest clothes and slathered themselves in heavy oil skins. Leaving only a single lookout behind, the crew boarded the lifeboat and headed out, and for six hours they braved the mountainous waves crashing around them like avalanches of water and the piercing cold winds. All this was done in an open lifeboat, by the way. The crew were trained to focus on their task and not to complain, so they kept searching for any sign of the ship on the horizon. They knew the crew of the schooner were depending on them. They never saw the ship, and they found nothing. After they returned to shore and recovered, the Two Rivers crew began searching the beaches, and they found, rolling in the surf, bundles of trees and wreckage. It was soon clear, as other search efforts also found nothing, that the Christmas tree ship, loved by so many, was lost somewhere out on the lake. In my videos about the Orang Madan and the SS Waratah, I mentioned bottles washing ashore. Like from the SS Pacific and the city of Boston, and heck, it happened in the last story too. Well, the same thing happened in this case. A bottle with a message in it washed ashore and said the following, quote, Friday, everyone goodbye. I guess we are all through. Sea washed over our deck load Tuesday. During the night, the small boat was washed over. Ingevald and Steve fell overboard Thursday. God help us, unquote. It was signed by one Herman Schoenerman. The crew list does indeed show that there was a Steve Nelson on board, but the other name does not appear. He could have possibly been one of the persons on board who didn't have a recorded name. Remember, she had extra people on board on this trip. 
1927, another message in a, in a bottle was discovered, and it said the following, quote, These lines were written at 10.30 p.m., schooner Ralph Simons ready to go down about 20 miles southeast of Two Rivers Point, between 25 and 20 miles offshore. All hands lashed one line. Goodbye. This one was simply signed by Nelson. I'll let you decide on your own if you think either notes are authentic. Today, the exact location of the loss is unknown, but as I mentioned with the on-screen text earlier that the wreck was found in 1971. She is 180 feet below the surface. Why she sank is no mystery. She was an old ship and well past her life expectancy for a wooden ship like her. She was the only ship lost in that storm, and the Christmas tree business continued despite her foundering. Today, she is still fondly remembered as the Christmas tree ship, and she has not been forgotten, and her tale is reprinted every year in multiple publications. The Regina was a Canadian package freighter built in 1907. She was just shy of being 250 feet in length. She had a beam of 42.6 feet and weighed 1,957 tons. She began her service the year after her construction and remained in operation as her company was merged and consolidated into the Canada Steamship Lines. On November 9, 1913, under the command of Captain E. H. McConney, she left Serena, Ontario for Fort William, located at the west end of Lake Superior. As we've established, trips at this time of year were difficult, and the captain expected this to be much the same. In fact, there was already a gale warning in place as they departed port. The last sighting of the Regina occurred at 2 p.m. when the captain of the large steamer H.B. Hagwood saw the Regina upbound roughly 15 miles south of Harbor Beach. He was sailing his own ship to shelter at Port Huron, having had enough of the bad weather on the open lake, and noted that the Regina was burying herself deeply in the huge waves. Earlier that day, around two hours earlier, the captain had seen another ship around the same size as his own struggling in the weather, and this is what made him decide to turn his own ship around. That, that other ship was a vessel called the Prince, and she was not alone in having issues. Multiple ships were having trouble due to the weather, as what might as well have been a hurricane ripped across the lake. Waves swamped over the decks of many ships, rivets were popping out of their hulls like bullets, as the waves twisted and bent steel hulls. Many ships were stranded out on the lake, and the damage to the shore was terrible. By the time the water calmed, the Regina was gone. What was the first sign that something bad had happened? Ten of her crew washing ashore, dead, surrounded by debris, including a lifeboat. Meanwhile, an overturned hull was seen floating three miles offshore from Point Huron. This turned out to be another ship, which sank eight days later when the air holding her up finally seeped out. What's weird, though, is that the bodies washing ashore that were thought to be the crew of the Regina weren't from the Regina at all. They were the crew of this other ship, but they were wearing the life jackets from the Regina. This second ship was the Prince, but why were her crew wearing the life jackets from a completely different ship? The best answer we can give, though we ultimately will never know for sure, is that sometime during the storm on Saturday night, with visibility basically at a 0 out of 10, and the vessels having been shifted off course due to the rolling waves on the lake surface and the bad weather, which is something I mentioned having possibly happened to the Waratah too, check out my video on that, they ended up being pushed right into each other before either saw the other. In the following minutes, the crews of both ships kind of hopped from one ship to the other while the vessels were tangled together, until everyone realized the Regina was sinking fast. So the Prince crew donned the life jackets from the ship they ran into, as those were the only ones available, and returned to their own ship, likely with the Regina crew as well. How this collision occurred, we just don't know. The last time the vessels were seen, they were 15 miles apart, so we can only speculate. Our guess is that the Prince made a mad dash for a sheltered port or cove, got caught swamped up in the waves, and by a stroke of bad luck, 
was thrown right into the Regina. Shortly after this collision, she capsized and her crew were thrown into the water, where they washed ashore wearing the life jackets from the ship they hit. Another theory that the author of Went Missing suggests in the chapter about this incident is that the Regina found the prince in distress and sent a lifeboat to the stricken vessel with life jackets in it, and the prince crew then scrambled down a line into this boat, put on the life jackets, but had their lifeboat swamped and washed away. Shortly after this, the Regina was then overwhelmed by the weather and went down too. Both of these are just guesses. We'll ultimately never know. The Regina still rests on the bottom of Lake Huron somewhere, undiscovered. Until she is, she'll keep her secrets. The prince has been found, though. She rests upside down on the bottom of the lake in 70 feet of water. Storms like in the last story were the bane of schooners. Ships which needed gentle winds to push on their billowing sails. A sudden wind shift could cause great peril to such a ship. A lot of schooners also suffered from not being maintained beyond the bare essentials. In bad weather, rigging would often snap, sails would blow out, and what gear was salvaged would then be recycled. So you can probably guess that many schooners kind of just disappeared, and yes, they did. There are many which disappeared on the Great Lakes, ships which left port and were never seen again, the South American being one of them. Weighing 100 gross tons, the South American was built in Vermilion, Ohio in 1841. In November 1843, when the schooner was only two years old, the South American set out from Buffalo, carrying a cargo of salt under the command of Captain Brady. Her course was set to take her across the entire length of Lake Erie, roughly 250 miles. The South American never reached her destination, and she was never seen, and her crew were never heard from again. Today, the only guess we really have is that late year weather, which we've covered throughout this video, was responsible. The ship might have been overwhelmed by a sudden gale or squall, increased wind, or other rapidly deteriorating conditions that happen on the Great Lakes in the later months of the year. The only thing we really know is that somewhere on her 250 mile route, the South American was swallowed whole by Lake Erie. And that's it. The ship has never been found, and we have no idea where whatever happened to her even occurred. She'll likely never be found. So, that was four stories of ships which disappeared on the Great Lakes. All told from stories provided in the book, Went Missing. I hope you enjoyed and found this interesting. This was a lot like my Wartaw video, but instead it had multiple stories and they were much shorter. And it's no secret that I love the Great Lakes, considering I put pictures I took at Indiana Dunes last summer on screen for each story, and I cannot wait to go back there again next year. In fact, my love of the place is what made me want to make a video about the Great Lakes and share more of just the pictures I've taken. It's gorgeous up there, but there's also a lot of good history and I love shipwrecks, so... This video is just a bunch of stuff I love. So which of these ships did you find the most interesting? I'm curious. I think it was the story of the Christmas tree ship for me, but I want to know which one it was for you. And if you want more of these stories, uh, tell me. There are plenty more in this book, I can tell. I could make a series out of stories out of this book. If you're interested in that, let me know in a comment. Now, if you want to see more stories like this, check out my video on the disappearance of the SS Waratah, my video about the ghost ship Orang Madan, and my video about a terrifying ghost ship which ran aground in Norway back in the 14th century. I also have a book called The Night the Fitz Went Down, which is about the Edmund Fitzgerald, a ship which sank in the Great Lakes also, arguably the most famous ship to ever sink in the Great Lakes. I could do a video about that someday, um, but probably not immediately. I want to talk about ships which vanished around the world on the oceans next. But before we get to any of that, the topic I'm covering in the next documentary video is the giant theropod carnivorous dinosaur Acrocanthosaurus, 
It'll be a teaser for what the big video about the Cretaceous, which I'm doing later this year, either in the summer or fall, kind of just depends on how busy I am, is going to be like. I also really want to make a video about the SS Pacific and one of those ships which vanished out on the ocean after that video, but there's not really enough story for me to dedicate a whole video to, so I'm thinking either maybe I could write a historical fiction story and narrate it with all the known facts included. I have an idea for one, and I do want to narrate stories written specifically for YouTube, not just the ones read for my upcoming books. I don't know, though. I might just make it a video like this, which is the other option, where I tell multiple stories in one video about ships which vanished at sea and make the SS Pacific one of them. We'll see which one I go for. It'll probably be a video like this. Now, if you like how I tell stories, as I just mentioned, I've written and narrated several original stories, so please check them out. I'll link the playlist below along with all of my other documentaries, which cover a wide range of topics. This is my 10th one, so there's a lot to look at. With all that said, I'm going to sign off for now, so I hope you enjoyed. Like and subscribe if you want to see more videos like this, and I will see you in the next one. And check out some of my other content. I don't just make documentaries like this. Like I said, I narrate and write original stories read from my upcoming book, and I also make gaming content as just a more fun and relaxed and laid-back type of video. Those are kind of on pause at the moment since I'm just kind of waiting for FNAF Plus to come out. But when it does, I'll be playing it, and I can't wait. I know gaming videos aren't as popular, but sometimes it's nice to just put out a more laid-back and relaxed video that I don't have to spend days to weeks working on before it can come out. Anyway, though, there's a lot you can check out, so I'll link a playlist below which has a mix of the content I make. So please check all the linked playlists out, and I'll see you in the next one.